Ready, ready to go, yeah. Okay. So, uh, uh, good afternoon and good evening to everyone. We have Dr. Richard Carr, consultant, histopathologist and specialist in derma uh, dermatopathologist from Warwick Hospital UK, lecturing us today on uh, follicular squamous cell carcinoma. Dr. Carr developed his interest in uh, dermatopathology, uh, training with world-renowned experts uh, such as Dr. Philip McKee and Eduardo Colangio, the St. Thomas Hospital and the St. John's Institute of Dermato Dermatology. Dr. Carr has uh, the Royal College Pathologist Diploma in Dermatopathology and became an examiner for the diploma in 2005. He receives uh, cases uh, for his expert opinions from other histopathologists throughout the UK and he's also on the executive committee of the UK Dermatopathology EQA scheme and currently a co-opted member of the executive committee for the British Society of Dermatopathology. Uh, Dr. Carr has authored uh, or and co-authored around 80 published papers. He lectures regionally, nationally and internationally in dermatopathology. And he is a very uh, fun person on a personal level to interact with and has a very uh, interesting uh, way of finding uh, uh, interesting data in cases. So, and, and he will show that to you in his lecture, because when I saw or, or listened to this lecture about two years ago in London, I thought that this is one of the best lecture I ever heard. It is about a very common topic uh, putting a very, very special spin on it. And since then, I have been trying to uh, get him on this program. And that's why I'm so happy that this is happening right now. So with uh, uh, no further ado, I would like to ask you, uh, Richard, to uh, present this uh, very interesting lecture for us. Uh, thanks very much, Laszlo, for the introduction. Um, I would normally speak very quickly in talks, and I apologize if I'm speaking a little too quickly for some uh, listeners, um, but I do have a lot of images to show you. Uh, this topic is something that we've been working on for quite a while now, and uh, certainly I find it very exciting, and hopefully I will be able to engage you in the topic, and I will hope tomorrow when you go to your microscope that you will make a diagnosis of follicular squamous cell carcinoma. Um, so by way of introduction, just click on that for talk. We're going to discuss the gorilla in the room. Um, normally it's the elephant in the room, but for some reason I've chosen a gorilla for this talk. Um, so I'm going to discuss the fact that this tumour is uh, under-recognised. I'm going to give you the diagnostic criteria, uh, the microscopic features, and then I'm going to show you a large number of cases and variants. Uh, we'll discuss very briefly, if there's time, the differential diagnosis. Uh, by that time, Laszlo may cut me off to, to, to just go to the last uh, few slides, but we'll see if we can get there. I'll discuss the behaviour and staging, and I think this is probably the most important thing. The take-home message will be how it affects the patient at the end of the day. in the room. Well, the gorilla in the room is keratoacanthoma. Uh, it's a, a tumour that you will very really, rarely hear discussed in public. And uh, in fact, I, when I gave a talk in London uh, a few years ago that Laszlo mentioned, I did, I did state that I, I wasn't sure if I was old enough yet to give uh, a talk that included a discussion of keratoacanthoma. I, at that time, I'd only heard David Whedon speak in public on the topic, and he was very close to retirement. Um, but, it's, uh, but, it, but it was particularly the fact that Philip McKee had given me this message when I mentioned to him that I was thinking of possibly talking about carotid canthoma in public. Um, and, his, and these were his comments, hopefully you can read them on the screen, that if clinicians really believed in the diagnosis, they would just leave it to regress. Um, that many samples were too superficial to make a reliable diagnosis. And, uh, and that he'd seen cases that had been called KA with 
that ended up with disastrous results and metastasis. Uh, now, Philip McKee was my mentor from London, so um, obviously when your mentor tells you to steer clear of a topic, it, it, you probably should listen. On the other hand, this is a quote from David Whedon's book, uh, in which he says that Ka and squamous cell carcinoma are so different that their continued separation is essential if mistreatment of Ka's with perineural and venous invasion is to be avoided. Um, now, Ka can show venous and perineural invasion, and in personal communication with Dr. Whedon, he says he saved the patient from having a neck dissection because it was a keratoacanthoma that just happened to show venous invasion. And uh, his group had published that venous invasion didn't appear to carry any adverse prognosis in the setting of a otherwise typical KA. So let's look at a clinical case. Uh, this lesion has been present six weeks on the nose. And if you look at the uh, image C, you can see that the tumor has eroded all the way through the nasal ala emphasizing the fact that this tumor has grown within six weeks. Um, a wedge biopsy was done and described as showing broad pushing islands of keratinocytes with mild variation in nuclear size and shape and a prominent inflammatory response. The conclusion that the lesion was consistent with the clinical suspicion of KA that again did not exclude the possibility of a well-differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. So my question to you is, which well-differentiated tumour do you know in pathology that can grow to this size and invade through the nose within a six-week period? To me, the diagnosis here, based on the information, is, is a classical keratoacanthoma. Okay. As it happens, the patient was scheduled to have a, a, an excision of the lesion, which is commonly undertaken in the UK for keratoacanthoma. Um, but when the patient came back to clinic a week later, the lesion was starting to slough. He decided to watch this lesion and not undertake the surgery. And this is the uh, clinical image at 18 weeks. The authors pr proposed that a way to watch policy um, was not necessarily being proposed as the gold standard, uh, which currently appears to be surgical treatment, but they simply uh, illustrated the case to show that it may have a role in some patients. Um, I think just a brief comment about this is most KAs in the UK are excised um, and many very good surgeons give perfectly good cosmetic results. So I'm not necessarily saying that surgery shouldn't be done, but I, I do believe we need to have a proper clinico-pathological study to look into the biology of KA. In terms of reporting KA, you can see um, a survey which we did of 17 laboratories in the UK and published a few years ago. Now, I work in Warwick, which is the far right-hand bar of the column. Now, what this chart is showing us is the number of uh, coded specimens in our lab that were reported as either keratoacanthoma or squamous cell carcinoma. So you can see if you live in Warwick, you, and you have either a keratoacanthoma or a squamous cell carcinoma, you've got about a 28% chance of that case being coded as a keratoacanthoma on the pathology system. Now, in many cases, it may say in keeping with, favoring, but best regarded as, but you can see more than 25% of uh, applicable cases are coded as KA, and compare that with two other labs around the UK, uh, many of them below 10% and several getting close to 0%, uh, which I would put in the McKee category. Whedon did publish in one of his papers that he had a rate of about 30% uh, of KA to SCC. Okay, so in Warwick, we diagnose a lot of keratoacanthoma. Uh, this is a paper which David Casarino was the senior author for, where they reviewed keratoacanthoma. And their opinion was that the, the, the overwhelming weight of biological, morphological, clinical evidence favoured KA as benign, or at worst, a low-grade squamous neoplasm. Now, I have never ever referred to KA as benign, um, but I do think it's a distinct clinico-pathological entity that very rarely metastasizes, less often than basal cell carcinoma, for example. And I certainly think uh, KA can be recognised
um, in most cases, relatively straightforward. A couple of small, these small snippet biopsies uh, that Philip McKee was referring to. And uh, the history is of six, six weeks. Um, it, it started as a pimple, developed a plug, uh, uh, which appeared to drop off. And the clinical impression was that, that it was a KA, but the lesion was on the ear. Now, if we take a, a sort of scanning view, you can see some well differentiated rounded structures on the lower right of the field. We can see that the tumour is very much obscured by a dense inflammatory. You wouldn't necessarily call this area well differentiated. There's quite a prolific look to the tumour. So we're into the category of one of those cases where you've got to make a leap of faith. Do you believe the six week history um, that this could possibly be a current? Pay attention to this area where we get this uh, incredibly well differentiated epithelium developing from the proliferative areas for is the entrapment of either collagen or elastic fibers within the tumor. Just my arrow, hopefully you can see my little arrow pointing at an entrapped, probably elastic fiber that's just not staying very well with the EVG stain. Okay. And we can incorporate it into the tumor. Particularly if you see these fibers within areas of mature squamous differentiation, um, I, I don't recall ever seeing that in a, in a, in a, a squamous cell carcinoma. So really do look for your elastic and collagen areas. Okay, we'll come back to elastic entrapment uh, later on. But I actually reported this as part of a well differentiated squamous proliferative lesion with inflammatory reaction at the base, given the history in keeping with a keratoacanthoma. And in Warwick, uh, that diagnosis would be supported by uh, an air discussion. In fact, the patient was discussed at the multidisciplinary meeting. Um, and uh, when discussed, they had a residual crater, uh, which failed to resolve completely and eventually the clinical colleagues um, felt they had to remove it and when they removed the lesion by wedge resection of the ear there was just a flat crater with no residual lesion seen. So that very highly proliferative rather malignant looking lesion had disappeared completely. And so the approach in Warwick is that we diagnose a lot of keratoacanthoma. We rely heavily on the clinical features. Ideally, you'd have a rapid growth in weeks, although you must appreciate lesions can persist for a long time. And sometimes the lesion persists indefinitely. They look very well differentiated down the microscope compared with the duration of growth. And that's a, a big clue to the diagnosis. You may see perineural or vascular invasion. And if the tumour is otherwise typical, you shouldn't be put off. Uh, they do appear to very rarely metastasize, and there could be several explanations for that. They could undergo additional mutations. They may be a type of squamous cell carcinoma that occasionally metastasizes, just like a basal cell carcinoma. And has a superficial resemblance to a keratoacanthoma. We could see some fairly well differentiated keratin on the surface. But even at the scanning view, uh, there are features which I very much do not like, and that is the tumour is almost going down as deeply as it is wide. So if you see a vertical orientated lesion that looks a bit like a KA at first glance, just hold yourself back. Most KAs I report very rarely extend into the subcutis to any distance. This tumour is wading down through the subcutis, so that would be something to be uh, cautious about. Here that there's marked cellular pleomorphism. I reported this as a poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma of follicular variant, and we'll come to discuss all of the features in greater detail as we get there. But this particular case did have many keratoacanthoma-like features, and when I'm assessing the diagnosis of KA, uh, I will probably weigh up all of these features, very much like the setting of atypical spitz tumours. You're weighing up 20, 30 features, and you're coming to an overall opinion. Now, in my scoring system, this case scored 48% uh, 
and uh, that would put it firmly into the category of a squamous cell carcinoma. To put it into perspective, um, KAs come, around, come in around 25%. So most of the features that you see on the screen um, would be um, across to the left-hand side. So particular features that I do not like seeing are um, the, the tumour dropping below the sweat glands, um, marked asymmetry, depth down through the subcutis, growth below the sweat gland coils in particular. Okay, but um, this lecture isn't really discussing KA, it's just to let you have a bit of background as to the uh, context of where I'm coming from in Warwick. We report a lot of carotid campaign. And we use a pragmatic report. Um, so often we say it's got the typical or classical features and don't worry too much, just sign it out as in keeping with the KA and keeping with the clinical diagnosis. When you've got cases that you find more difficult or it's a smaller biopsy and you're not so confident, you could say it's in keeping with, but you're not entirely sure it, it isn't an SCC and just admit uncertainty, just like you would for an atypical spitz tumour. And there are some cases where you, where you need to be a bit more aggressive and say that you think you favour an SCC. And now we'll look at the, um, oh, and of course, clinical pathological discussion. So don't take that all on your own shoulders. Discuss it with your clinical colleagues if you get the opportunity. And we're very lucky in Warwick, all of the cases where applicable will get discussed at MDM, and each patient will get managed on the basis of the perceived degree of risk. I would probably say, 80, 90% of cases I'm happy with the diagnosis and don't have to sit on the fence too much. From KA, it's a team approach, risk, risk stratify, consider watchful waiting, obviously if the lesion's growing or persisting, it's likely to get completely excised with clear margins. Um, I think it's something only for specialists. You obviously can't make the diagnosis if you've not been trained to do it. Many places in the UK, and I'm sure it's the case in America, won't even allow you to make the diagnosis. So um, you're going to be struggling, <laughs> particularly if there's a, there's a whole weight of, of um, people out there who are saying it doesn't exist. I think we need an awful lot more research into carotid campoma, and we've been trying to set up a, a clinical trial for quite some time. Hopefully we'll make some progress in the next few years. Okay. Uh, not used now, but just a, a, um, a visitor attraction. Attack now and discuss the main focus of the lecture, which is the follicular squamous cell carcinoma. So our traditional concept of squamous cell carcinoma is that there's a gradual progression from actinic keratosis through Bowen's disease to invasive squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, a, bit, a bit like the setting in um, the cervix, I suppose. And here we see a very typical actinic keratosis where the dysplasia is in the interfollicular epithelium and shoulders the edges of the follicles. As the lesion becomes um, more bonoid, the cells become undifferentiated and quite basaloid in appearance. See how many invasive bones or bonoid actinic keratosis lesions that we saw out of all of our SCCs uh, in, in the year of 2013. We found only four cases where we perceived there was pre-existing full thickness bonoid dysplasia with invasive tumour. Now, by definition, invasive bones is, is poorly differentiated and would normally be regarded as a high-risk high tumour. But as I say, we only saw 4% of all SCC that had this pattern in a year. When I refer to follicular SCC, I'm specifically not talking about basal cell carcinoma, which is perceived to derive from the follicle. I'm not I'm talking about malignant transformation of trichoepitheliomas or trichoblastomas. I'm not talking about the pilometrical carcinoma that derives from the hair bulb. Malignant pilar tumours don't have an epidermal connection. They're exceedingly rare. Um, what I am talking about is the tricholemal carcinoma, which according to the literature is exceedingly rare and shows a pattern uh, differentiating towards the lower outer root sheath, often relatively circumscribed lesions with clear cell pattern. And I am talking about a lesion that you might have heard of as infundibular squamous cell carcinoma, or sometimes just shortened to follicular SCC. Um, this is said to be an exceedingly rare tumour. Um, 
Diaz Casca Joe first reported it less than one percent of their cases. Um, Ms. Ms. Argaretel, less than 1% and so on. However, in Warwick, we think this is the commonest type of squamous cell carcinoma. So we think more than 50% of all squamous cell carcinomas are follicular SCCs. And the reason we think they're so common is that authors haven't realized that the tumors often show infant fibula and trichalemal differentiation. Um, the paper from Diaz Casca Joe dates to 2004. And it was after reading this paper that I began to recognize SCCs that arose from the follicle. Um, and here's an example of how the rate of diagnosis was exponentially rising up to the current situation, where in 2013 we found that nearly 60% of all of our SCCs were favored to be follicular in origin. Um, obviously, I want to discuss with you the metastatic rate and uh, how this can affect research. In terms of clinical features, um, we've got 103 cases that we've um, followed up and characterized very carefully. Um, actually, some years ago now, and we still haven't pub published it, but um, in essence, it shows the same uh, clinical features as the diaz Cascajo paper, generally a, a tendency for them to be elderly patients with severe sun damage, usually on the head and neck, just like most squamous cell carcinomas, because most squamous cell carcinomas are follicular in origin. I mean, one simple fact would probably uh, help you to believe this. And as you know, basal cell carcinomas don't occur on the lips. And I can tell you, I also report ENT cases, and I very, very rarely see invasive squamous cell carcinomas on the lip. So it's just one small additional bit of evidence that supports SCCs mainly arising from hair follicles. In terms of the clinical diagnosis, many of the cases were thought to be BCCs because if the tumour arises from the follicle, it will arise within the dermis primarily and produce a tumour with rounded borders. And so quite frequently, clinically, they will mimic a basal cell carcinoma. Interestingly, very few of the cases in either the diaz casca Joe or Warwick a uh, larger series were clinically thought to be keratoacanthomas. So that's, that's a bit surprising because we think keratoacanthomas are also follicular tumors. Okay. So here's an example of uh, one clinical image from Warwick. The tumor does look a bit like a basal cell carcinoma with a rounded border. Here's one that, um, you know, clinically you could confuse that with an inverted follicular keratosis or trichalemal horn or, or a sort of benign lesion. And that's an, another example from ours. Okay, what are the diagnostic criteria down the microscope? So I'm going to show you graphically first. There should be relatively circumscript epidermal connections and usually you can tell that that's at the site of a hair follicle. Um, you shouldn't, um, you, you will often see a very bright abrupt orange keratinization within the lesion and if you look to the periphery of the tumour in the well differentiated cases, they're relatively circumscribed borders or almost completely circumscribed and have a tendency for a peripheral palisading. Um, you won't see Bones disease uh, in the adjacent epidermis. Obviously, many of these patients have severe sun damage, so you might occasionally see incidental actinic keratosis, but the focus of the lesion is this abrupt tumour that takes off from the hair follicles. Uh, obviously, you need cellular atypia. And a clue to the diagnosis, which wasn't recognized uh, previously, was the presence of central acanthophyllitic pores. Now, if you think of actinic keratosis, you often get suprabasal acanthalysis, not usually with mucin in pores. In follicular SCCs, it's often in the center of the lobules uh, and has a blue. So this is an example of a small in situ follicular squamous cell carcinoma, or you might want to call it a follicular boanoid actinic keratosis. And you can see the pores of mucin at low power. You can see the rounded borders. You can see the very abrupt connections at the hair follicle. And if you look between the two centers of the tumor, there's no dysplasia or bone disease. And if you look to the far left and the far right, there's no actinic keratosis or bone disease. So, so many, um, uh, cutaneous horns are actually follicular lesions and, and they have this sort of bright orange some mucin and you can stain that with alcium blue. You can see there's some acanthalysis and dysplasia and the subtle peripheral palisading. 
splazeric anthelysis. Uh, there's an Alcyon blue just to show you that um, it's a type of mucin, and as you know, there's a variant of mycosis fungoides which accumulates mucin in the hair follicles, follicular mucinosis. So we call this follicular mucin. So you can get rid of it of hyaluronidase. So it's a soft tissue type of mucin, not a not an epithelial mucin. And there's diffuse P53 staining, so that would support your diagnosis. In some cases, they can be quite subtle displays. Your differential might be inverted follicular keratosis. With follicular FCCs now ranging from small, relatively banal lesions right up to horrible, highly invasive metastasizing tumors. So here's another one. You can see the center of focus is on the hair follicle. And you can actually see the sebaceous unit draining off the bottom of the tumor there. You can see the abrupt lateral uh, connections, um, particularly in this top right image. You can see the bright orange abrupt cratonization and the pilar or trichelemal type epithelium, the subtle palisading of the cells. Uh, again, that was about invasion here, and provided that was excised, the patient wouldn't necessarily need following up for this lesion, despite being two or three millimeters thick. This is a similar lesion from the original Diaz Cascajo paper, and I, I don't think they recognize the fully in their tumors, but it was evident on looking at the uh, images of their paper. Okay. And you can see their tumour also looks in situ um, with pushing only borders. I think if you only recognise these small lesions, then you'll get a very low percentage of follicular SCCs in your series. Big lesion and rather exophytic, but pushing only borders. And even at this low mount power magnification, you can see the pools of um, basophilic mucin and the bright orange, orange rounded structures. If you look at the epidermis, where you can see it, there's no suggestion of dysplasia or Bowen's disease. Obviously, this tumor has grown out onto the surface, so you might not appreciate it was a follicular lesion if you don't pay attention to the specific features. Abrupt keratinization, you can see the pores of mucin, and you can see the cellular dysplasia and that the epidermis overlying the tumour lacks actinic keratosis or dysplasia. So this is one from the ear. Again, you can see the acanthalytic change, the subtle palisading around the edge of the, um, the bright orange keratinization. And in this case, again, a pushing only border. So normally an eight millimetre thick lesion like this, SEC on the ear would be regarded as high risk for metastasis. If it's got pushing only borders and you think it's a follicular SCC, uh, we believe that you can just excise it and not necessarily follow the patient up. So there'll be many elderly patients that don't need follow up in clinics. This is sort of the, the extreme small example of the tumor just connected to one infundibular unit. Again, no overlying actinic keratosis or dysplasia. Lots of acanthalysis and again a P53 down at the bottom right showing the diffuse positivity. This lesion clinically was thought to be a KA, and you can see why it's growing as an exophytic lesion on the side of the nose. But you do not see acanthalytic mucin in keratoacanthoma, in my experience. So, whenever you see spontaneous acanthalysis, don't think of keratoacanthoma. I didn't discuss it in detail, but KA is a highly infiltrative tumor, it doesn't have pushing borders like this. So, this again would be a feature that you wouldn't see in a keratoacanthoma unless it was already almost fully regressed. Rest. The youngest patient in our series was a male of 22 with hydrognitis suppurativa, which as you know is a chronic uh, follicular occlusion disease with extensive scarring. And in this case, you can see the very well differentiated carcinoma with the pools of mucin in the tumor. So that's the only younger patient we've seen in us. Uh, here's an example of a lesion that would be called trichelemal carcinoma in the literature. Um, and it's small, relatively circumscribed, and looks quite clear cell, but in fact, it's actually very spongiotic, so the cells are not that clear. You can see the nice mucin that I've demonstrated in the other cases. 
Um, and this case has got a null P53. This is the reactive P53. But I would say quite a good proportion of our follicular SCCs have a null P53. So look out for the completely negative P53 as being supportive of the carcinoma. Um, CD34, as you probably know, is very helpful for the diagnosis of trichilemoma, a tumour of the outer root sheath. But in all the literature that I've studied, virtually no trichilemal carcinoma has ever shown CD34 positivity in the epithelium. And there's an example of a, a tumour I consider to have trichilemal differentiation that is also CD34 negative. Follicular SCC, you start to see some variants, and this is a basaloid variant, could easily be signed out as a basal cell carcinoma. You can see the abrupt connections at the surface, particularly in, in slide B. Um, this one's not so well differentiated, it looks invasive at the base, and uh, Burry P4 is negative, which you'd expect to be positive in a BCC. EMA can stain follicular SCCs in some cases, but it's, uh, it's a bit variable. And again, C34, negative, I think. Where follicular SCC could easily be signed out as a basal cell carcinoma. In fact, the tumours only abutting via the follicular infundibular focally. You can see the pool of mucin. And the, in, in the follicular SCC, the mucin is within the epithelium. In the basal cell carcinoma, generally speaking, the mucin is in the retraction space between the tumour and the, and the stroma. And this tumour is very undifferentiated with these sort of rather rhabdoid cells. In our experience, Berry P4 is extremely sensitive for basal cell carcinoma. And as you can see, the Berry P4 here is virtually negative, although basaloid SCCs can show some staining. Um, and the tumour is mainly EMA positive, but the, the EMA often does stain the follicular SCCs, even the basaloid ones. So, so this tumour, if it metastasizes and has been signed out as a basal cell carcinoma, you'll think, oh, basal cell carcinoma is metastasized, but obviously many of these so-called metastasizing BCCs were signed out before immunohistochemistry was available. So I think any old paper that includes metastasizing basal cell, you have to read with a pinch of salt. You must do Berry P4 and EMA in all the cases. And EMA is intensely negative in, in the basaloid areas of basal cell carcinoma. So a negative EMA in the basaloid areas is just as important as a as a positive Berry P4 for the diagnosis of BCC. An example of a follicular SCC with, that is more multifocal, and, and the tumour in this case has multiple abrupt connections with the surface. It's got the mucin pores, it's got the abrupt trichilemal keratinization, and it's got a feature you don't hardly ever see within squamous cell carcinoma, that's calcification. If you see calcification in the tumour of squamous differentiation, it's almost always of pilar origin. Think of BCCs, they often have uh, calcification because of the pilar differentiation within the BCC. So a tumour like this that's got pushing only borders, again, we would regard as a low risk. For the test. Publications in the literature would have illustrated follicular SCCs with a, with a more widespread infrastructure pattern. Um, you can see that they have multiple connections with the surface, but they lack into follicular actinic keratosis or bones. Um, I call this one a multifocal plaque type with an infrastructure pattern, probably low. And this is an extreme example of it. Only one area of the tumour focally connects abruptly uh, with the surface, uh, despite cutting multiple levels. This is a highly infrastructure one. Keratinization. Vascular invasion. And it's even got these blue grey keratinocytes that you can see in some types of um, follicular tumours. Um, this is just another example of the highly infiltrative one uh, with perineural invasion. And the Zargo and colleagues have published similar cases to this one. And we've got that small biopsy. Um, and the clinical this time is slowly enlarging. So if you remember from the beginning of the lecture, we showed a very similar biopsy from a lesion that had been present for six weeks that I said was in keeping with a keratoacanthoma. In this case, we do have some elastic entrapment. We do have um, some very well differentiated areas. 
but it's got rather rounded borders to it. It hasn't got a well-formed crater. It's not showing good regression. So in this particular instance, it was a difficult case with cross-cutting. Uh, it had an infiltrative border that may represent invasion, uh, possibly the follicular variant of squamous cell carcinoma, and I said it was extending to a depth of two millimeters. So uh, I thought a follicular SCC. In fact, on excision, you would never have even considered the possibility of a carotoecanthoma uh, with a lesion that's extending so regularly down through the subcutis with widespread acanthalysis and severe pleomorphism. So the biopsy came from the top of the tumour, which was very well differentiated, and the bottom of the tumour was poorly differentiated follicular SCC, which would have a high risk for metastasis. So, so although we diagnose an awful lot of carotoecanthoma in Warwick, very similar to the ratio that we didn't diagnose, um, you have to appreciate that uh, the limitations and also think about clinicopathological correlation. Lesions that on the surface of the tumour are relatively well differentiated, but at the base running vertically down through the subcutis, running through the elastic and collagen with severe pleomorphism and acanthalysis, and these are high risk tumours for metastasis. And another case of well differentiated on the surface, but poorly differentiated on the base. So this is maybe the reason why Philip Mickey saw cases diagnosed as KA that behaved badly. They were not carotoacanthomas, they were follicular SCCs that have gone unrecognised. For example, with lots of follicular mucin to the left hand side of the tumour, and if we look, look at high power, the tumour is poorly differentiated and runs through the elastic um, in a very uh, aggressive fashion. Again, I would expect a high risk of metastasis. So you can see the mucin as well in the, in the tumor. You see the nice rounded shape that clinically might mimic a BCC, the central infundibular part of the tumor, but very poly differentiated. And this one was only 3.5 millimeters thick, but did metastasize. Okay. You can see the lack of actinic keratosis or bonoid dysplasia, the very focal connection with the surface, the abrupt trichelemal keratinization, and this one uh, metastasized eight millimeters in depth, the tumor was. But look at the infiltrative borders. The tumor that came closest to being called a carotoacanthoma, it was sent clinically as a KA. Um, I looked at it and thought about diagnosing a KA. Fortunately, I favoured a squamous cell carcinoma. And this one metastasized several years later. This, this was from um, an eyelid, this tumour. So, so I think you'll have realised that you only make the diagnosis of KA if you're confident of the good clinicopathological correlation. I haven't spent much time going into the detail of KA, but it is published in our paper on follicular SCC, the specific features that would push you towards uh, carotidic vertically orientated lesions that go straight down those are the ones to look at very carefully even if you're thinking about KA um, you, can, you can pretty much stop fairly quickly when you look at the base of this tumour with the follicular mucin and the acanthalysis uh, this one metastasized so in terms of differential diagnosis uh, very briefly we will discuss it um, can be exceedingly difficult, and it depends on whether you're looking at one of the small, well-differentiated lesions or one of the more highly infrastructive, sort of um, challenging lesions. Um, Pseudoepithelioma hyperplasia, obviously, inverted follicular keratosis, trichelemomas, we like to see C34 positivity, it will lack the pleomorphism, it will have a thickened basement membrane, which you don't see in follicular SCC. Sometimes you see Merkel cells, reactive Merkel cells in the lesion, which I wouldn't expect to see in an SCC. And usually they'll just have a wild type P53. Uh, I would emphasize you can get a basaloid variant of tricholemoma. Then I've got a conventional SCC. Well, here I've got a slight problem because I'm not sure what conventional SCC is anymore, given that we think most SCCs derive from the hair follicle. You could argue conventional SCC is follicular infundibular trichelemal SCC. Uh, Cratoacanthoma, clinical correlation being the most important thing. Um, and basal cell carcinomas, diffuse berry P4, and a completely negative EMA.
uh, but they may be very keratotic and have central pale. So the abrupt keratinization to bright orange is not specific for follicular FCC. You can see it particularly in genital FCCs, acral FCCs, um, but it is distinctive. So I just wanted to make that point. That you're taking several features to come up with your diagnosis of follicular FCC. Let's give the, the diagnostic criteria. Um, this would be an example of a sort of follicular actinic keratosis in the use in the acanthalysis in the horn. So I'm reporting this more regularly now that I begin to recognise a very circumscript lesion. See a lesion that looks like a follicular FCC next to an actinic keratosis. I think it's partly because many of these patients have such severe sun damage, you're bound to get hybrid tumours. Um, so seeing a bit of actinic keratosis doesn't necessarily put me off diagnosing a follicular SCC. And I think this probably is a, a hybrid lesion or a collision. This lesion but it has many features of a follicular SCC. You've got the mucin, a little bit of acanthalysis, the circumscript borders. Um, I called this inverted follicular keratosis. We could do a P53, that could be quite helpful if it showed either a wild type staining pattern to support the diagnosis or if it showed a diffuse positivity or null phenotype to support the diagnosis of follicular SCC. Lesion, on the other hand, relatively circumscribed, pools of mucin, does have significant cellular pleomorphism, as you see to the bottom right. And I called that uh, a follicular SCC with pushing only borders. It's a low risk lesion. We regard these as in situ tumours and the patients won't necessarily be followed unless they're being followed for other reasons. Two tumours, one completely circumscribed, pushing borders with a crater, I called a follicular SCC. The other, highly infiltrative borders with a central well-formed crater, symmetrical, I called a proliferative keratoacanthoma. It's almost counterintuitive. And if you look at the literature on KA, you'll see many tumours that look like the one on the left called KA, including the patients on vemurafenib for, um, for melanomas who develop both KAs and uh, SCCs. Okay, learning points. I think it's still markedly under-recognised. So there are some people in the UK now who are coming around to the idea that most SCCs derive from the follicle. Typically occur in elderly patients, males on sun damaged skin, and clinically can be confused with the BCC because of the rounded borders. Follicular mucin is a good clue to the diagnosis. It can be seen in other follicular tumours like trichelomoma, inverted follicular keratosis. Um, so it's not entirely specific, but a good clue. It's present in about 60% of the cases we, we reported in our series. Many of the tumours are well differentiated with pushing only borders despite being quite thick lesions. And if they would have been called FCCs, they would, on the vulva, for example, you'd have a, you'd have a vulvectomy and probably a, a lymph node diet. Section. So just bear in mind that even quite thick SCCs, as long as they've got pushing only borders, they probably don't need any further management, just an excision. And this is why we need to recognise this tumour throughout the world, really, and save a lot of patients um, many visits to hospital being followed up for no reason. Um, you must be aware the ones that have the cray terraform growth, the well differentiated superficial areas, but the, but the highly malignant lower areas that can give rise to metastasis and probably explain why some so-called KAs have metastasized in the literature. Is Laszlo awake? Laszlo is awake. He was just muted because not to have the sneezing, you know, coming into the lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, it was very, very good. Now I think uh, everyone can see that we are missing or haven't been diagnosing follicular SCCs uh, as often as we should, you know. And thank you very much for giving this, this uh, talk. Uh, you guys who are at home uh, or with your computer, uh, we have a chat window and we have a few more minutes uh, to ask some questions. So please uh, put your uh, questions in. In the meantime, I will ask a few questions if you don't mind. Uh, one of the thing is that uh, <clears throat> I like to do is actually P53 and P16. Uh, 
staining. And uh, mm -hmm. my rule of thumb, uh, I mean, I, I'm just kind of cur curious what you think about, you know, the differences between uh, keratoacantomas and uh, follicular SCCs or, or regular SCCs. Mm -hmm. My finding is mm -hmm. that, well, uh, that, I mean, then I will tell you what I think or what, what my experience with it. No, please tell me your experience. Okay, so my experience with keratoacantomas that I see them typically negative, <laughs> and there is actually a, a, a you know, the epidermis that is uh, connected or close by to the keratoacantoma has actually a positive pattern consistent with um, actinic keratosis or hypertrophic actinic keratosis uh, to the side. Mm -hmm. uh, what is also mm -hmm. interesting that, you know, when you are excising these guys and, and then you get the excisions uh, and that is that pseudoepithelomatous hyperplasia, when you do P53, then usually the stromal cells are P53 positive below the tumor, below the uh, pseudoepithelomatous hyperplasia. So that's kind of an interesting mm -hmm. stuff. The other thing is with P16, usually, you know, areas that I'm also kind of considering, well, do they have viral features, you know, coilocytes or uh, papillomatous changes? Mm -hmm. They could be very mm -hmm. P16 positive. And, and that, those are the two stains that I'm actually uh, using uh, to find my way. Yeah, I, I, I'm trying to think if I've ever run a P16 on a KA. I'm not sure I have. My experience with P16 is it's the best marker for bones disease. It marks all bones disease, just like very P4 marks, basal cell carcinoma. So my experience with follicular SCCs is P16 doesn't stain them in a block positive pattern. So basically the follicular SCCs are not coming up with P16. I think the null P53 seems to be more common in follicular SCC off the top of my sort of head than any other tumor that I've seen. So I think that's an interesting story why they're often null and whether that's got something to do with the uh, follicular you know, genetic pathway. I'd be interested to know from the molecular geneticists once they get once they get hold of this story and they start working on the follicular side of things, um, what they will find. But certainly, P53, I, I, I never studied it much in KA because I assumed if it was helpful, other people will have already thrown it at KA. I mean, obviously, people have done a lot with KAs with molecular biology, and they found that in general, KAs have about half the number of mutations compared with so-called conventional SCC. The problem with all these studies is nobody recognized follicular SCC. And I think they've diagnosed KA wrong in many cases. So unless it was me looking at the slides telling you what I think is a KA and, a KA and what isn't a KA, none of those previous studies that have ever been done would be of much use. It's a bit like the basal cell metastasizing story without doing very before an email, you can't really say much. But, but I think P16 is a great marker for bones. It doesn't yeah. appear to stain the follicular tumors. Yeah, um, probably those bones, you know, that are 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 virally uh, associated. Because I, I have a couple of bones, you know, which are negative actually with P16. But uh, coming back to your uh, one of your point that you said, you know, that the uh, KAs have uh, less genetic abnormalities than. SEC. It would be actually a good study, and I don't know if, if you will have a chance to, to run some of these study, studies to compare, you know, uh, the superficial portion and the deep portion of the tumor and see if there is a genetic... Uh, is this like, you know, we see in melanomas that there is a heterogeneity of uh, the tumor uh, at different areas. I don't know if it would have like less amount of genetic abnormality at those very very differentiated uh, areas that are so deceiving you know with the superficial uh, biopsies and those areas that are highly aggressive deep in the subcutaneous fat that would be an interesting study to see is there any uh, differences in, in in genetic content or uh, genetic uh, yeah. mutational uh, number uh, yeah, that, you're right. That would, yeah. yeah. 
Because but you can see why you can get a disaster if you get just the top of one of these lesions and you're not seeing the base. So, I mean, many of the reasons why people say you shouldn't diagnose KA can be can be perceived in those cases. Um, but I still diagnose KA all the time. Yeah, but what, what I'm uh, trying to say, you know, is is that uh, the genetic studies are flawed because of the sampling of the tumor. So the thing is that I can imagine that, you know, when they do this on keratocontomas, then the entire lesion is, is, is getting in. Uh, however, if you would do like a micro dissection and, and go for, let's say, the very differentiated superficial area and compare mm -hmm. that to the deep, uh, unequivocally uh, uh, invasive and aggressive area, we would be able to find probably differences in the genetic uh, mutational level. That would be an interesting study. I have a question here uh, that do you use intraepithelial microabscesses, uh, the polymorphs in the diagnosis of KAs? Yeah, they're very, they're very uh, typical of KA and not, not that common in SCCs. So yeah, they're, they're one of the useful features. Uh, the other question that I see that is there a genetic marker predicting KA uh, regression? So probably, uh, I think that's the that's like literally the the the, the sort of uh, holy grail and where we would like to get to in terms of this study. The, the clinical study we set up is going to be based on um, patients that present with short histories. They look like KAs um, clinically, and then we want to biopsy them and then um, have a, a formal protocol where the patient is then watched for a month. If the lesion is, is stationary or regressing, it will be left to regress completely, and the diagnosis will be based on, of KA will be based on the clinico-pathological features. And obviously the follicular SCCs, we can use the ones that have metastasized, we need to be collecting the ones that metastasize. So, so I know another group in the UK are looking for metastasizing SCCs. Um, obviously, I've got you know just over a handful of cases that have metastasized so far. Um, so it takes a it takes a long number of years of collecting, uh, say KAs that have been punch biopsied and then excised, and so you actually know the lesion has undergone full regression before you can actually say definitively that is a KA. So doing these studies requires people to make a leap of faith that they believe in KA, undertake proper clinico-pathological studies, and then for all the molecular uh, you know, biology we have available at the tumours. And, and I, I repeatedly say we put a man on the moon in you know, the 1960s, apparently, but we're not able to work out the molecular biology of KA. It's ridiculous, you know, a common tumour that we see every day in sign up. And we didn't recognize that more than half of SCCs arrive, derive from the hair follicle. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's very true. You know, I think uh, <laughs> Dr. Rigoli might be able to be of help on this because he has some uh, brilliant ideas on, you know, how to create data banks and uh, uh, for uh, the, the best and most appropriate stratification of these cases. So then, you know, uh, if we would be able to categorize this uh, or catalog these tumors, we would be able to uh, pull like a good number or significant number of metastasizing cases and compare that, you know, genetically uh, with the typical uh, K cases. Uh, another question yeah, I, agree. I, I have here is that in cases of uh, atypical proliferating triclamal tumors, do you see transformation to the direction of invasive squamous cell carcinoma? What is your experience? So, so we're talking about the proliferating pilar tumor. Correct. Well, for a start, they're very uncommon. So you probably see one or two a year compared to all of these other tumors. I mean, Ackerman believed that they were all carcinomas just ranging from well differentiated to the more poly differentiated ones. In my personal experience, I've seen probably ooh, less than 20 proliferating trichelemal tumors 
so far I've not seen one that behaved badly uh, but you can well imagine them recurring and they do grow to a very large size you can well imagine them uh, undergoing frank malignant transformation but but I haven't got any experience of one metastasizing um, now if I've got another concept about in situ tumors. When, when, when we started to realize that many of these follicular tumors were in situ, if you look at a lot of that adnexal tumors, uh, for example, sebaceous lesions, you see cases that are quite pleomorphic but are completely circumscribed. And I, I began to realize they were carcinomas, they were just in situ, they hadn't broken the basement membrane. So, so there's even papers out there that talk about you know, sebaceous tumours with discongruent features where they were circumscribed like a sebaceous but had clear morphism. So to me, these are all insight examples of insight to adnexal tumours. Um, so, so just like Merkel cell carcinoma very occasionally has an insight to only tumour. I think we underestimate the number of adnexal tumours of the skin that, that are insight to carcinomas. So they so they can have slightly malignant looking features cytologically, but not, but not architecturally. So I don't know if that answers the question because yeah, I... proliferating trichalimbians are very rare. I mean, occasionally you see an epidermoid cyst or a pilar cyst that's undergone frank malignant transformation. So I guess it must happen. Yeah. Uh, another question, and probably this is the last question because we are running up to the hour. Uh, when the follicular squamous cell carcinoma starts uh, invading or it is microinvasive, where should we measure the thickness from? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, where do you measure the thickness of any SCC? Yep. Uh, I mean, I think it's a very difficult one. I mean, if I, if I think the tumor is invasive, I normally give the full, full depth, I suppose. But I guess the, I understand what the question is saying. They're, they're, they're indicating that you can have a large rounded tumor that may only have a tiny bit of invasion. I suppose that if I thought that was the case, I might convey that to the clinician. But basically, if we see any infiltrative areas of the tumor, the patient will follow up. It's only pushing only borders that we accept as um, not being followed up. So uh, that's the practical message. I see, I see, pushing only borders, I think that, and that was very nicely uh, presented today because you showed uh, countless... And 50% uh, of these tumors are pushing only. Yeah, yeah. And they can vary from a few millimeters thick up to eight or nine millimeters thick. Uh, yeah, I think the, really the nicest thing that I, what I saw, you know, this uh, subcutaneous involvement and those... Uh, invasive versus you know uh, the pushing borders the importance of that i mean those are very very important points today and can i say one thing about pushing only borders make sure there's no elastic or collagen entrapment okay uh -huh. because that is a highly infiltrative that if you see that in a follicular scc it's a poorly differentiated highly infiltrative lesion so bowen's disease when it invades looks pushing um i wouldn't call that so once bones disease invades, I don't regard that as a tumor you shouldn't follow up or isn't high risk. So there's pushing and there's pushing. Completely circumscribed with no cutting across the elastic and collagen. Once you see the tumor growing through the elastic and collagen, it's no longer pushing only. Thank you very much. Uh, well, Richard, thank you again uh, for the excellent lecture. I would love to have, uh, we were talking about, you know, Merkel cell carcinoma and different kind of uh, the concept of uh, uh, the two types of Merkel cell carcinoma it would be great to have a lecture on that uh, sometime. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's got a lot more complicated with <laughs> that story. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, if, if you have, uh, I mean, this is uh, not just uh, lectures, but these are also like a conceptual uh, platform that. Uh, you know, people who are joining to this meeting can ask questions and, and talk about it. So it is like a, a mini conference, which is which I, I like a lot. If, if you like, I've got a nice talk that I gave to the, the Royal College of Pathologists on um, fur EP4 and EMA in basaloid tumors. Um, yeah. I could do that at some point in the future. That, 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 would, be, that would be great. Uh, we are uh, back to the hour. And uh, I know that it is getting late, uh, and we really appreciate that uh, uh, you 
gave this lecture at this uh, late hour and after hour for us. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I am going to reach out to you for sure uh, regarding the Basalite talk. We all enjoyed this uh, excellent lecture. Uh, thank you so much and have a great night to you and to everyone. Bye bye for and see um, you next time. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, Richard. So is Laszlo staying on the line? <laughs>